there. And we'll get chat up. Come on. You can do it, Twitch. I believe in you. Hey, it says we're live now. I tell you the Wi-Fi password for our school many years ago was who is your daddy? <laughs> I mean, we are streaming on Twitch. It's okay. This was years ago. <laughs> okay. That's a terrible sorry. password. I'm just pointing it out. <laughs> so that's my password uh, to my shady VPN. That, that is that, fantastic. That I don't mind giving out because I don't really care. Because I have another VPN, but I just want to say that. <laughs> Where okay. why why can I not get my chat over here? Give put that over there. Theater mode this. Do that. Okay. Now we've got chat. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> uh where are we? Uh okay. Ready? Where are you? I lost yep. you. I gotta do I'm this. Here. I like looking this way oh maybe not okay well whatever i'll move it while we talk okay three two one hello everyone welcome to episode 251 of the security podcast here on the in 30 network my name is heim cohen and i don't know where tom is but he's not above me i know that he's either to the left or to the right of me uh let's so, see i'm gonna pick this way uh, i don't know i'm gonna assume that you're right because you set it up in fact, Tom's ears is the computer that sets it up because, yes. because we need a gaming machine to do this because we still, because I don't know, because Google couldn't figure this out yet. We're zooming and we're this and we're that and the other thing, but no, we can't get yep. this going. We are I mean, using guess... a, uh, a 2080 graphics card, 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, I've got an overclocked i7 in there. Uh, we're on an M2 SSD. So yeah, we're we're streaming at you live with only the best technology. And and as my son says, the screen right now is laggy. So I just had to close all my Electron apps and just leave Chrome open. So we'll go from there. Um, so so I mean, we're again, we're still talking about having trouble coming up with topics because things are not go. I mean, I guess it's a good thing. Look for security when there's no real problems. I mean. That's a good thing. Let's let's not. I mean, it's bad for us, but it's good for everybody else. So, um, I, I just will start with saying, if you have a, a Pixel Two, you are out of security updates, which makes me really, really, really sad because I love my Pixel Two, and my wife loves her Pixel Two. But there's an Apple announcement on Tuesday, and as you all know, I'm, as long as Apple releases an iterative update to their phone, I mean, we don't know. I will most likely get an iPhone 12. I mean, unless they like get rid of the screen and it's like the one button and you just push. I, <laughs> the Siri only phone. It's just like yeah, a like, tiny speaker and a button to talk to her. For $1,000. Yep. Like as long as they release an iterative update to the phone, I will probably most likely get it. Um, I've come to grips that it probably won't be USB-C. It probably, I think it will have 5G. So I, the 5G was, yeah. I think, a deal breaker because because I'm going to hold this phone for a law for three or four years, and I don't want 5G to be a January thing. And now I'm holding the phone for a while. So I think the the deal breaker may be 5G. But now that you're telling me that Android, uh, the Pixel Two, will get his last update in December, I'm probably going to go on that bandwagon. So and What's then. Weird? And, and I, I swear, I'm not an Apple fanboy. I'm quickly becoming one, though. But what's weird is that after two years of holding any Android phone, and I was on you know the Nexus and Pixel lines, like I wasn't buying cheap stuff, I was clawing at the walls to get the next phone. Uh, like, like holding an Android phone for more than two years was really painful. But like I've, I've got this iPhone 10, and it's fine. Like I, I honestly don't see a real need to upgrade right now. So... So I was with you and next, but 
the Pixel line of phones and the Nexus line of phones actually held up really well. I mean, yeah, after two years, like it's like you kind of go that third year, but since now both companies, both Apple and Google, have committed to longer, longer lifespans of phones. People are holding them. I mean, T-Mobile is doing 36-month payment plans, which I don't recommend ever anybody do, but they have 36-month payment plans. Apple is now famously really going five years. So that's a really – now, Now I, again, I guess some privilege is showing. If you can buy a new phone, if you're like, my phone is up, buy the newest iPhone. Don't get something that's old. Just buy it and keep it for five years. Don't buy like a three-year-old and be like, oh, I'll just hold it. Just buy the newest one. Android, obviously, we talk, Google. I think now is going toward the mid-range line. But you know what? I have my I have my iPad Pro. I really do like it. Um, I'm on a Mac. I figured it's time to just go back to the iPhone, and and I'm happy with my iPad. So what's the difference? So yes, I can keep my phone another year, but there's no security updates. And I think Apple wants to get rid of all ports on the ne- uh, not this phone, but the next phone and be straight wireless charging. I will be really pissed if they switch to USB-C next year instead of this year, but I don't know. <sighs> but yeah, I agree with you. It's Android after two years is slow and now it's they're doing three years and I can do another year with this. But yeah, it's they said so three years. Updates. And again, it's hard to. Look, we're a security show. It's really hard to explain what problems you really have with with these security updates. Like, who is going to do this type of attack on me? And and the answer is we don't know. But the fact that it's there means that it's exploitable. I, I mean, you're more worry. I mean, your 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 bigger worry is downloading a bad app from from the app store or for side loading or whatever else. But you don't want to be in a position that the thing you use the most has this critical vulnerability that will never be fixed through some Wi-Fi exploitation or going to some malicious website or something like that. So that's why we care about the updates. Yeah. And I, I think we're, we're toying with, with something pretty dangerous here because uh, the, I would venture to say that the majority of people with Android phones are running something that right there. They're not like, tech heads they don't care about the latest technology it's it's a tool it's a tool to help them in their lives or you know keep them from getting bored on the train and a lot of people are holding really old phones that haven't gotten security updates in a long time i I think we're sitting on a giant potential botnet that just hasn't gotten turned on yet um it'll be it'll be interesting in like a a horrifying way when that does happen but um, you know, if, if you see one of your relatives with a super old phone, if it's not getting updates, if you know, like, oh, hey, that's like a Galaxy 3. Hey, uh, Uncle, un- Uncle, what's his name? You should, you should probably not use that. <laughs> uh, the problem is it goes back to, okay, I need something concrete to say this is what could happen. It's It's hard to say, well, it's being exploited in the wild, but you can't really, like how i mean we could talk about it we can theoretically talk about it but that's really the problem and and if you're using your phone like you said just to keep uh sane on the train or gps or whatever it is it's it's i actually get more problems updating my phone than the being an attack vector for viruses which is a different problem altogether because uh, getting getting a botched update where you lose stuff makes you never want to update your phone again but yeah we get it. I want to be secure because I use this everywhere. This this goes everywhere with me. But again, until you can point to something like something tangible, it's really hard to convince people that you need these updates. So that's always my problem to gripe with. Yeah, agreed. Do you want to talk about the T2 security vulnerability or not Not this week? Not, not this week. Uh, I'm still digging into it. I'm still looking at it. Um, it's interesting for sure, and we will be talking about it. Um, but I, I need a little bit more time to get more informed before I start spouting information out to the internet. Well, so just really fast without saying, because I definitely don't know about it. The T2 chip is the chip that houses the secure enclave on Apple's phones, right? That That's yeah. where this... And they found the vulnerability in there, and that's what we'll leave it at. And how bad is it? We don't know. 
but so this would be at... the t2 chip on the macbooks from what i understand um i'm not sure if the phones are directly impacted but this is it looks like a, another variation on the evil main attack uh when you get physical access to a, a device and i don't know how many macs have oh maybe now all of them have touch id in the corner they all have this some secure enclave but yeah, it's not not all of them, but it's becoming more popular. All right, well let's let's move on because, like I said, it's uh, it's that that's something for next week. Um, so so this week we wanted to talk about open source and mainly like what is open source, what does it actually mean, what benefits, little different things like that. So I'm gonna let Tom start with. Uh, do you want to explain what open source is? Yeah, so uh, you might have heard the term open source. You might not know exactly what it means. And it's super simple. Uh, open source can mean a wide variety of things. But generally, it's accepted that if something is open source and all of the fanatics are going to yell at me about semantics and how something is really open source or just source available or the difference between open source and free software and like an OSI approved license. Like we're, we're not getting into that. We're going to keep this super high level. Open source is generally when a software program is or algorithm or helper or a piece of software is developed out in the open and the license will allow people to contribute back code or use the code freely or modify that code to fit a different purpose or to work better for themselves. Um, and there's a lot of semantics in there about what is and isn't an approved open source license. We're, we're going to try to dive into that a little bit, but just know that just like with anything nerd culture related, Star Trek related, mechanical keyboard related, especially that there's a wide variety of opinions and information out there, and it all comes down to semantic flame wars and arguments. So, generally speaking, open source is how to develop an application or an application that's got its source code available to be hacked on, used, and abused by the wide populace and whoever really wants to. So, my the first thought that came to my mind when you talk about nerd flame war was when uh, TrueCrypt shut down. They had a license that didn't allow anybody to take it. Like it was open source that you can view it, but you couldn't do really anything with it. And somehow Veracode became the new standard, but it wasn't exactly TrueCrypt. And that was another little issue there. That was my only thing with when we got to the licenses. Like I, like, I don't know what any of these licenses are, but I don't need you to explain them because like you said, they're really deep in the weeds. And I don't think anybody, this is not the show for that. Yeah. Yeah, so, TrueCrypt is, was basically something that we would call source available, where it wasn't using an open source license. Like, you didn't have the right to take it and build your own version of TrueCrypt. You didn't have any right to hack on the code or submit patches. Um, they did accept uh, community updates, but it wasn't like a part of their standard model. And so what Veracrypt did by taking the code and making something open source is they took what we call a legal risk. They said, well... The TrueCrypt author shut down TrueCrypt and ran off. Chances are they're not going to sue us, so we're just going to steal the source code. And that's that's what they did. Like, it's it's theft with a good purpose. Don't get me wrong. I love Veracrypt. I use Veracrypt. Uh, but they did break the terms of the license agreement by taking that code and uh, making it functional again. Um, that's, that's not mince words. It was, it was a Robin Hood-esque theft. So uh, let's 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 move on. So open source, we're saying, is code that's freely available in some capacity to look at to do stuff with. The licensing is going to be a different. We're going to get there later if we have time. So what are the mm -hmm. benefits? So you, you wrote next the benefits of open source because we say it's like oh you want everything to be open source, but what does that mean as far as what can we do with it? Yeah. So the easiest thing you can do with it is. Like, let's say, let's say an application is going away or something is shutting down, but the code was open. That means that, like, let's say tomorrow, Mozilla shuts down, right? Mozilla, Firefox, it's no more. Luckily, Firefox is open source. Like, the, the core code that powers the browser, your interactions with it, all that stuff is out in the open. Anyone can build their own version of Firefox. Uh, as a matter of fact, 
companies have been built on the backs of taking you know open source browser code and building their own browsers out of it. Um, so you could theoretically, if you were technically inclined, uh, you could take the source code for Firefox, build it, and run it on your own machines. You could give it away. You could hand it to people. You could make modifications, security fixes, different hacks, speed improvements. Like you would have the ability um, legally to take the source code for Firefox and make it do what you want to fit your purpose or anyone else's, right? If you wanted to take, if you wanted to take up Firefox, if you want to take up that mantle and decide I'm going to build a browser and maintain it just like Mozilla did, you can, you absolutely can. And that's the beauty of open source is that you're not locked into any one solution space. There's no big corporation saying you must do this or you can't do this because the code is open and out there. Now, the licensing terms, again, we're going to get into, but generally they're all pretty well accepted that end users can take that code and do whatever they want with it um, for the most part. Um, and, and that's kind of where things get into the weeds. So, so I mean, we hear this a lot with the company shutters. Uh, mainly IoT companies, a like company goes under or whatever it is, and they're going to brick all their devices. A lot of the time, the community says, can you at least open source it so I can continue using it? Now, I see that as mainly a death wish because, because one of the things we talk about in the weeds is that a lot of these open source projects are run by one person. Like uh, the open SSL people, I think is literally two or three people and they run a significant portion of the internet, probably 95% of the internet and they're begging for money and they're getting scraps and it's an open source project that is, that is basically running the internet. The other one was, and agree with me is uh, Chrome and Chromium and Edge. So Chromium is the open source and mm -hmm. companies like Edge and Chrome and Google take what they want. Android, another one. Android has AOSP and and again, there's licenses with Oracle right now, but that's a different show. And uh, and Amazon makes their own version of Android, and I'm sure in China they have their own versions of Android, but Google makes the one that you obviously know. And again, it's based on open source software. <clears throat> yeah. So this means that you know you no longer have to build things from the ground up. Like building an operating system is not easy. It is really difficult to make a general purpose operating system that gets used by a bunch of people and solves a, a lot of common problems. Um, so you you had companies um, like AT&T, right? They're, they're building AT&T Unix, right? It's, it's their operating system. No one's allowed to do stuff with it. Uh, Microsoft Windows, right? Like you do have to have a license key to use Windows. It has to be installed, uh, you know, somewhere with Microsoft's blessing. Uh, Apple famously says, hey, you can only run our operating system on our hardware. You cannot install it on other stuff. You get like a slim little margin of, yeah, you sort of can by using a virtual machine, but on top of real Mac hardware only. But in general, they tell you how you can use their software and you don't really get many options to fight back, at least not legally. Um, with an open source operating system, so take, you know, Linux is, is the most popular example or BSD or even Chromium OS that Google puts out. Um, those are open source operating systems and you can generally install it and run it wherever you want. I don't need a license key to install Linux on my Raspberry Pi. I don't need a license key to install Linux on my, my PlayStation 3 or my phone or one of my several computers laying around, right? The, the code is out there and you're able to use it to solve problems. Usually installing Linux on your Raspberry Pi causes more problems, but that's a different story. Yeah. So I, mean, a, I mean, installing any operating system will cause yeah. problems. It was a perfectly secure device before you had to make it functional. Yeah. So now we talked about the good things about this. I mean, obviously there's going to be bad things to it. And I see mainly like you can't monetize this, but that's also not true either. But yeah, everyone like, wants you know, money for their work. Some some companies freak out. They're like, but if we open source it, no one's going to pay for this. And that's that's not entirely true. There are people out there who won't pay for it, who will say, hey, I don't want your binaries. I'm just going to take your source code build it myself and we'll call it done. Um, and there are projects that operate that way. Like there's a fantastic uh, pixel art editor, Asprite. Asprite has a pro version. They have a paid version where 
you can pay and you get the application. You can also just download their source code, build it yourself and not have to pay for it. But that's some extra steps. They're, they're relying on people to say, I value the developer's time and I value the convenience of what they're offering that I'm going to throw them five bucks and call it a day. And that's okay. You can do that. There are even entire companies built around uh, open source operating systems. Uh, so like Red Hat. Red Hat takes free open source available software. They do a lot of their own development that's fully open source. And they package it up and they say, this is a commercial Linux distribution. You have to pay a license for it. And we're going to give you support. You're going to get the official Red Hat branding. You're going to get uh, access to a, like an internal knowledge base. Like They do some value add stuff. But if you wanted to, theoretically, if somebody were to take all the source code from Red Hat, strip out all their, their trademarked branding, and build it and publish like a Red Hat operating system, but it's not really Red Hat for free, they could. And that's actually exactly what happened with CentOS. They take the source code from Red Hat, they built it themselves, they published it, and now you have a totally free unsupported by the company, but a totally free version of the Red Hat operating system that you didn't have to pay for. And that's okay. That's by design. But some companies might really balk at that. Some companies might be afraid to put that out because, oh man, this code is so ugly. And I've been there too, right? I have written terrible, terrible software that I don't want the world to see because it's clearly a reflection on me that I made like a stick figure drawing equivalent in, in code. Um, there's also the issue sure. that Do people license that just so they don't see the the ugly source code. Is that a yeah, thing? Yeah. Yes, oh, absolutely. I, okay, okay. Absolutely. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, yeah, people people are afraid of code quality uh, or are getting blasted by the community saying, "Wow, you did this? Come on, man! You can't just push an array like that. You got to do this thing and then make sure that your length constraints are met." And like. Uh, nerds can be really, really mean in code reviews. And some people just don't want to deal with that. And I, I totally get it. Um, the other thing is that if a company knows that they're sitting on a dud, if they know they're sitting on a pile of like security snafus waiting to happen, they might not open source the code because if the code's out there, it's going to be easier to exploit, right? It's, it's a double-edged sword. So yeah, somebody can look at your code, find vulnerabilities, and then attack them. But generally, if you open source your code and people are looking at it, right, they have a they have some kind of interest in you as a as a developer or as a product. We've seen plenty, 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 plenty of uh, projects that were open source or even just source available where community members said, hey, this thing over here might cause some issues. You might want to fix it like this and they hand over a patch. This is the other massive benefit is that you're no longer locked to like you know, the three or four people that might be on your official committee for open SSL, right? You can now crowdsource this effort. You can say, hey, can somebody review this code? Can you make sure it's safe? Can you make sure it's performant? If you've got a better way to do this, can you offer up patches? And now you get quite literally a community around a piece of software generating more and more code and better and better work as time goes on simply because you put it out there. Right? It doesn't work all the time. Like there's plenty of projects that only have a single maintainer and they will only have that one person building it for the rest of all time. But something like Linux has got hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people contributing code because they love it, because they love the system or they have requirements that Linux isn't meeting yet and they want to make it better. They want it to work with their particular system or drivers or hardware or whatever, and they can uh, and it's super, super powerful. I, I remember this joke. If there's, what is it? If there's X Linux programmers, there'll be X plus one distributions so they can all argue at the the the, the solitary remaining one on how exactly. that one is worse than theirs. That's the other problem. It's, 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 it's by committee. And when you start hating the committee, you, you branch off and you have other open source things, which is also really good. I mean... I mean, it sounds like, okay, so somebody made this and you're taking it and you can, based again on the licensing, you can make a company around just the support and maintaining this this product on based on its core, which is, which is awesome. And I mean, if we want to talk about the security side of it, being able to look through it, like we talk about Signal being one of them. 
Uh, Threema now is another one. We are open VPN. If you can see what's inside, you can say what's actually going on. One of the things that Signal always says is if you don't, if you think that we're supply chaining infecting this and putting a backdoor, here's our source code. Build it from source and put it on. You can do that. Nobody's stopping you. Here's the code. This is how it works. And you can see it, which is also a huge, a huge positive. Yeah, you can look and actually verify that, you know, the thing running on your phone is actually the result of the source code being built. And there's there's something to do with deterministic builds, which is way out of scope for this conversation. But um, there are ways that you can mathematically prove this source code resulted in this binary. And if I hash the binary on my phone and hash the binary over here that I just built from the source code, they're going to be the same thing. They're provably the same application. Um, so it does really have a lot of security benefits. Now for licensing, right? I'm going to like go super long. This is really boring. Licensing. This is really, really boring. This is extremely boring. So it means generally, <laughs> yeah. Uh, generally, licensing will fall into a, one of a few different camps. Uh, one of the more popular ones is a permissive license. So stuff like X11 slash MIT slash expat. There's, it goes by a lot of different names. Basically, that license says, hey, you can do whatever you want with this code as long as you put my name somewhere in the credits. Right? You can package it. You can sell it. You can make your own derivative and make it. Uh, you know, and close the source as long as you say somewhere in your credits that you did use my application somewhere. Uh, it's basically making sure that you just get a mention. Um, if you go to like your PlayStation and click on one of the menu options, it's open source licenses, you'll see stuff in there for like BSD code and curl and stuff like that. And those licenses are generally written in such a way that a company like Sony can build it into the PlayStation and then just make sure the authors get credit somewhere in a menu item that's buried somewhere. And that's great. That's fantastic. It means that people don't have to go through a lot of rigmarole to use a license. There's also copy left. So what copy left licenses are is that they want to make sure that the stuff gets shared. They want to make sure that a company like Sony can't take this stuff, make their own twists to it, and then not give back to the community. So basically what those license, uh, licenses say is, yeah, you can use this and you can modify it, but any modifications you have to upstream. You have to also make sure it's open source. And the GPL even goes further with, um, with you know, basically how programs are built and linked together. And it says that if you use GPL code as a component in your application, anything that touches that or combines with it or is linked with it also has to be open source. Um, and it's it has worked in Linux's favor to be under the GPL because you have companies like TiVo or Google or other people making modifications to the Linux kernel, but then they have to take those modifications and give them back to the community. They have to say, here's the work we did based on top of your original work. Here it is. So somebody else can build upon this further. Um, you know, the, the right or the wrong around it, it's kind of up to you or your company and what you think you want to do. The easiest option and the stuff that most of my code is licensed under is the MIT. Uh, license, which says, hey, just put my name in the credits. Like, honestly, I don't care. Use the stuff or don't. Um, it's it's a really easy decision for me to make. But you might like the GPL. You might want to make sure that stuff remains open. Uh, and you can make those decisions. I mean, I look at it as, <clears throat> so Google maintains AOSP, which is the Google Android open source project, which is pure Android. And then Google on top of it puts its skin, which is the Google Play Store and everything else. And I guess, like you said, if they're changing the mail functionality, they have to push that back into AOSP. Unfortunately, it sounds like what they're doing is they're now they're pushing Gmail over that and Chrome over that. So they make the, the changes that they need to make, but they're siloing the good stuff, which by making separate apps based on the original open source thing, which that kind of bothers me. I don't know, I, but then I feel like, you know what? They're a business, they're trying to make money and this is their value added that you're paying for. You can buy, I think you can buy an AOSP phone. I think you can just buy, I, I don't know who makes one, but I'm sure they're available. Some, they some are no -name. available. The issue with AOSP is that, sure the core might be open, but the stuff to actually make the phones work, 
the binary blobs, the drivers, the stuff that says, here's how you talk to the, the GSM or CDMA or LTE radio. Here's how to talk to the GPS radio and Bluetooth, like those sort of things that really make the phone function uh, are generally closed source. So you're going to have so a fully yeah. open source phone, but you're going to need some kind of proprietary technology to get the thing to talk to the hardware, which is really the core issue with AOSP. More and more things are being stuffed into blobs and more and more functionality is just being obfuscated. Well, for me, it's I'm just nervous that let's say someone takes this podcast and finds all the time makes a show a clip show of all of us, all the times of us on video doing something stupid taking freeze frames and making us look yep. really negative like I, I that's that's what bothers me i don't care and i actually kind of sort of we don't make money on the show uh if you found a way to make money i, I would like part of that money but but other than that it's i i think we i mean we do this as a hobby so we say here uh if you want to take it and you want to learn from it we would like obviously we want credit for it but if if you want to do you want to do something else with it just don't put our uh just don't make us look bad that's all i'm asking i, I can't see, enforce like, that yeah like asking asking that or throwing it in in a license would mean that it's no longer open source right because we're trying to control what somebody can do with it and there are open source licenses that do that thing there were open source licenses uh, licenses that say you know these big companies can't use this or if uh if you've worked with this branch of the u.s federal government you can't use this and those are not open source licenses open source is designed and generally accepted as you can use this for whatever it's a tool um, and I tend to fall on that side of the argument. I, I understand that we do need pushes for increased justice, uh, especially in some parts of, of the, the world to keep it high level and, and not politically charged. Um, but open source really, I, I don't believe has a need to curtail itself like that. It, it should be for the good of everyone. Um, but again, it's, it's an arguable point. I totally understand that. So what, Look, I, like for this oh. podcast, like we, we couldn't put this under the GPL or MIT. We could, but it doesn't quite fit. This podcast isn't code. So what do we do for things like music or art or video? There's this cool thing called creative commons, and it allows you to pick and choose what you want people to be able to do with your content, right? Like uh, for my gaming podcast, we use uh, CC BY, which is Creative Commons Attribution License, which is quite literally the MIT license, but for non-code stuff. So it says, hey, you could take my gaming podcast, you could chop it up, you could make that clip show where I've made really bad predictions or just look like a buffoon and put that out. You could even sell it. And that's totally legal under the terms of the Creative Commons attribution license. There are other writers you can apply, like non-commercial, like, hey, do whatever you want with this, but don't make any money without talking to me first. And then there's the stuff that's share alike. Hey, you can do whatever you want with this, as long as you give us attribution and you make sure that you also license it under this share alike license which means that other people can make remixes of that content. Uh, it's really cool. And you can like pick and choose what you want from these licenses. And it offers a really easy shorthand that says, oh, cool. It's Creative Commons. Bye. I'll just make sure to throw their name in the credits. I can use this thing, mm -hmm. carte blanche. It's really nice. It's a great shorthand. So if you are creating music or content and you wanted to open source that in some way, check out creativecommons.org. Uh, I highly highly recommend them and all their licenses are human readable until you wanted to click through to the legalese so it's super easy to understand it, look i always look for my school stuff i always any anything i make is i say anybody can use it because if the goal is to teach and to educate people why are we restricting it that you need my permission and my blessing even if i give it to you for, for just fine take it if somebody can benefit from it that's fine and and so for i mean i haven't been burned by that yet so until i do the answer is here take whatever i create uh i'll share it now a lot of the stuff i gather from all different sources so so of course you attribute where you got it from and then say here everyone take let's let's do that and and go from there because again it's world's knowledge let's let's get all the world's knowledge out there 
let's not put it behind the paywall, especially if you don't mind. Like I get paid, I get paid to do my job. So if I make some awesome lesson plans and you can use it to teach your kids at home while we're quarantining, more power to you. You shouldn't have to pay for that. So, oh, great. Just the, this other this other hot tip: the scientists. If you find a journal with an article that you want to read, but you have to and you have to pay for it for the journal, email the author. Almost always they have the license to distribute it. So if you're seeing something and it's like, oh crap, I don't have fifty I don't have fifty dollars to get this journal, whatever, email the author. Most likely they they have the ability just to send it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Most scientists just want their work out there. They're they're not gonna be concerned about the paywalls. Uh, a lot of the journals don't even pay the scientists for this stuff. They just take it and lock it up. With, um, with that said, especially with journalism, please, I mean, if you could throw the, the publication a few dollars to, to make ends meet, that's always the answer. The internet was started as free, but you can't, you can't eat, you can't eat on free there. So there's no uh, thought you can't eat on thoughts and prayers and we hope you make money. So if yeah. you're reading a site all the time, all the time, all the time, consider subscribing and paying them. So, I mean, obviously whatever they they're asking for. And uh, I, I know I know we're over time. I wanted to give one last pro tip when it comes to Creative Commons. Let's say you don't care at all, right? Let's say you just, you made this thing, you want it out there, you don't care about licensing, you don't want people to throw your name on something, like you just don't care. It's free code, use it for whatever. It's free code or free art or free music. For code, there's uh, a, an actual public domain license. There is a license that says, hey, I'm releasing this code into the public domain. You can give me credit or not, whatever. It's like the most popular one is called the unlicensed, which basically says, I don't care. It's free code. Literally use it for whatever. It's committed to the public domain. You don't have to give me credit. You don't have to ask. There's no stipulations. There's no rules about it. It's free. Um, the Creative Commons has something like that. It's called CC0, where it says, hey, if your country has a public domain, this is now dedicated to that. It is completely free, it's open, it's unburdened, there's no licensing, there's no credits or stipulations, just use it however you want. And in case your country doesn't have a public domain, here is the terms, like here's the legal terms of a license that show exactly you know, what you can and can't do with it, which is you can do everything and you can't sue the person who made it. Uh, so there's like some indemnification stuff in there. So if you don't really care, Unlicense for code and CC zero for everything else. With that said, we are absolutely over time. So I'm just going to end it and we will see everyone hopefully next week. Bye. So bye everybody. Stop. Okay. Okay. Let me turn off Twitch.